everybody. I'm Rick Hansen, a neuropsychologist, author of Buddha's Brain and Hardwiring Happiness. And this is the Loving Brain series. I'm very pleased to be here with my longtime friend, very important teacher and benefactor, and a very well-known author and uh, therapist and teacher herself, Dr. Tara Brock. Uh, Tara is a clinical psychologist She's the founder and senior teacher of the Insight Meditation Community of Washington, D.C. Uh, she offers Buddhist and general mindfulness meditation workshops and retreats throughout the United States. Uh, her first book, Radical Acceptance, Embracing Your Life with the Heart of a Buddha, uh, was published in 2003 and has been a perennial bestseller that, since then. I've read it myself and recommend it wholeheartedly. She's also recently come out with another book, also from Bantam, True Refuge, Finding Peace and Freedom in Your Own Awakened Heart. Also having read that book and uh, written a little endorsement for it, I can tell you that True Refuge is also a phenomenally useful uh, read that's a very unusual combination of profound, penetrating wisdom and completely down to earth and full of practical help and saturated with heart and even some humor. Who knew? Uh, Tara's information is available at her website, tarabrock.com. That's spelled T-A-R-A-B-R-A-C-H.com, where she has a weekly podcast as well as a lot of other freely offered resources that are archived. And you can learn more about her, her books, and her teaching schedule at tarabrock.com. So, Tara, welcome. Really good to be with you, Rick. That's great. I detect that you're in your home, I think, in the woods. Yep, I'm in my cozy little office up here, surrounded by trees. It's lovely. That's yeah. great. Fantastic. Okay, so to dive in, um, I'd like to begin with the question that I routinely ask everybody, which is, why has it been important to you personally to become more skillful in your relationships? Well, the first thing that comes to mind, I have a, a reflection I do often. A lot of people do something similar, which is, you know, if you're at the end of your life looking back, what most matters? And always what most matters are the moments of um, real loving contact, of connection. So that's it. This is kind of being here together awake. And because there's so much strong conditioning, it takes intentionality. So it matters. There's a, um, there's a Buddhist personals. I don't know if you've heard of this, but there's a Buddhist personals, and it says, tall, dark, handsome Buddhist looking for himself. <laughs> and I love that because that's the, the ultimate misunderstanding that the, like the fruit of this path is in some way anything other than being in loving relationship with each other. Mm. Yeah. That's right. In other words, it's not navel-gazing, narcissism, and so forth. And then, if we could, broadening outside of the Buddhist frame, as valuable as Buddhist psychology certainly has been for millions of people over two and a half, you know, 2.5 millennia, you know, 2,500 years, uh, to mindfulness in general, you said something very interesting and powerful. I want to go back to it, which was... He said, there's so much conditioning that we need intentionality, speaking about the importance of becoming skillful or competent or more competent, as it were, in relationships. Could you unpack that when you said, there's so much conditioning, we need intentionality? What did you mean by that? You know, what, one of the ways I think about it kind of in an existential manner is we take form and we perceive separation. So even though I would say that the truth is in this universe, everything's connected, we perceive separation and get organized around a self that senses danger and, and also senses that I need, I have to have to make myself okay. Mm -hmm. And the way that plays out in rela relationships is that more than anything we need and want love and more than anything we're afraid of rejection. So mm -hmm. we have huge conditioning to get to that plays out with each other that where we're trying to protect ourselves and trying to get what we want and to really rest in a place where we can be honest and open and free with each other where we feel safe enough to be real takes a lot of undoing of that conditioning and therefore intentionality to take it on and stick with it day in and day out 
Yeah. I think that's exactly it, because we forget. We get caught in our fight, flight, freeze, reactivity, and we forget what matters. So it takes a, a remembrance. Yeah. That's, that's great. Thank you. A uh, question I ask everyone also, being as personal as you're willing to be, uh, what's a relationship issue that you've grappled with yourself, and how have you dealt with it? Well, there have been a lot of them. <laughs> I'll, so Take I'll, a number. <laughs> right. Which one shall we do? I'll share um, something more recently. I, I actually wrote about it in True Refuge and realized it was one of the most embarrassing things I had kind of confessed on in printed page, which is a sense in relationship, and this is specifically, and I'm looking at my marriage with Jonathan right now, how I can pr consider myself the special person. In some way, I'm so busy and my life is important and taking myself so seriously that in some way I make assumptions that we need to pay attention first to my timing on things or pay attention to what I want to get done or my tastes or my preferences. So it's your basic run-of-the-mill narcissistic, selfish, self-centeredness, but watching it play out ha you know, has been a wake-up. Um, I got married or we got together about 10 years ago. So, you know, assuming that I was going to be pretty mindful and attuned to see this kind of special person uh, persona emerge where, you know, in some way it had to be about me more than him. Um, mm. That's been a real wake up. And the way I've dealt with it has been, there's a suffering in it that creates separation because as if I'm, thinking my needs are more important, and Jonathan takes on the accommodating role, there becomes this distance, and then that creates suffering. So what I'm, I'm learning to do, Rick, what I've been playing with is every time the di I see the dance, I pause, like before I'm about to ask something or suggest something or request something or whatever it is, I really pause, and I, I've been really investigating in my body and in my heart uh, what's under that, both my fears about not getting things done and my assumptions, and if I can create a little space to even begin to investigate and let myself register, oh, this is getting in the way of connection, uh, I have more choice. I have the choice not to say, well, why don't you go to the post office? I'm too busy, you know, or the choice not to say, you know, well, I really think that looks better on, you know, my preference. I, I actually can um, let go and allow more spontaneity to emerge. Mm. Well, thanks for being so personal and um, also for normalizing, as it were, self-centeredness or specialness. And I think, too, in the culture, uh, we have a culture broadly that in the West and certainly in America that tends to emphasize personal branding, uh, celebrity consciousness that tends to feed into that, you know, universal human tendency to be want to be number one. If I could swerve here from our appointed plan because you've given such a useful thing, I think many, many people uh, who might be watching this series are in Jonathan's role. They're in the accommodator role, as it were. And Again, to grossly generalize, many exceptions, but I think it's statistically accurate to say, classically in a heterosexual couple, uh, the woman is in uh, that accommodator role. Often, obviously, in a you know same gender couple, one person often is in that accommodator role. So, with regard to the accommodator role, and not revealing too much about Jonathan, etc., but what could someone in the accommodator role learn? Uh, and take into account and apply, particularly if they have a partner, the special one, who's not as wise and accommodating as you? It's a really important question, and, and it's one of the ones as a couple we explore, because we try to s step into each other's perspective and see, well, what's it like, and what would help each of us to... Um, wake up out of our trance roles, you know, the ones we've been doing for a lifetime. Interruption, sorry, trance roles, trance define? Roles. Yeah. yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, when, in a way, we've all, you know, the, my understanding is that our 
patterns that we play out in relationships are set in really, really early, depending on all sorts of things, but primarily what happens with our, our caregivers. And, you know, we learn how to operate the best we can so we get what we want and avoid rejection. And for those that learned that accommodating was the safest way to go, the way, way to go if they were to maintain some connection and, and avoid punishment, um, mm. you know, the question is, you know, underneath accommodating, what's going on there? And there's often when, when Jonathan investigates, there's, and, and I've walked with this with many, many people, underneath accommodating a sense of my needs don't matter, People aren't going to pay attention to them anyway. Mm. Um, if I try to get attention, I'll be rejected or I'll have to really face that I don't count. And so the best strategy for maintaining something versus nothing is to be as you know accommodating and dependable as I can be. Yeah. And yet with that, there's a sense uh, that goes, a kind of sinking feeling of... Um, of completely kind of giving up, like I, I give up. I, you know, it's not it's not going to work for me to get my needs met. So here's the best I can do. Mm -hmm. So so for when that comes up, for the same reason to pause, and to get in touch with the undercurrents there of I don't matter, I'm not important, nobody's going to pay attention anyway, and that and there's an unworthiness in there, and it's actually a deep and poignant process to be with that and enough presence until there's really self-compassion mm -hmm. and 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 then in that self-compassion uh, the capacity to start to name with our partners you know when i accommodate underneath i'm feeling you know a sense of kind of giving up and i'm feeling like i don't matter and just hearing that like when when Jonathan says, you know, that's just my pattern, you know, people aren't going to pay attention, everything in me wants to pay attention. I'm no longer a special person. I'm just a human that cares. So the, the takeaway... Pardon me, you're the, saying that when the accommodator speaks from his or her heart and says, you know, I just feel kind of naturally slotted into this one down role, uh, and I, that can really tend to open the heart of the other person. That's right. When when there because the accommodator has kind of been resigned to this, and and underneath that, it's locked into a sense of I don't matter. And so, for either role, Rick, whether it's the special person or the accommodator, the naming of that it's going on and the naming of what's under it, because for both roles, there's vulnerability under there, um, helps the other person. Uh, both become more compassionate rather than defensive, and and then it actually brings up a, a capacity to creatively change the dance around. Right. So naming what's happening, but especially naming one's own experience. That's that's the whole. That's where it starts. Is for each of us to pause enough to get in touch with our own experience. For me, underneath the special person, there's a lot of shame. I mean, it's, it's, there's shame at being so self-centered and there's shame at needing to be the special person and for demanding and so on. And um, for him, there's a sense of, oh, I don't matter, I'm not important, I'm not worthy. For us to get in touch with that and then share that with each other is the beginning of changing it. Right. Well, I think you're talking about something very broad and important. Um, and so if we could build on this, for a person in the real world who's in a relationship with someone, let's say, who is a caring person but not the world's best communicator, uh, and by the fact that his or her partner is a special person and wants to be a special person, they, they like the status quo. It's working for them, all right? So how can a person who's this accommodator do speaking from the heart well? How can he or she help him or herself from the inside out speak from the heart effectively? And in terms of literally do's and don'ts around words or tone and whatever, what's your practical wisdom about how a person can speak from the heart with the best odds likelihood of it influencing the other person? 
one of the things under the accommodator and even under the resignation is a very deep anger and betrayal of the world for not caring and not having them be important and it's and it's easy to go from that resignation to when you begin to name something to having the anger and the blame go to the person you've been in a dance with and it it's not that that's wrong it's just that it doesn't work it does whoever you're speaking to if they whatever is delivered with anger or blame doesn't end up being received in a way that's useful so part of the deep work for the accommodator the one that feels um I don't matter, I'm not worthy, um, they didn't care, is to also process that layer of anger. And because, you know, there's a reason that person withdrew and just started accommodating it. And the anger, once it's tapped, is, is, is a very vital force. And so the trick in working with anger, and that we all have anger, is A, and this is for me, I, I find this really useful, is to forgive that it's there. And forgiving doesn't mean, oh, this is bad, I forgive it. It means to truly uh, regard with compassion and allowance that, hey, this is another weather system that's inside me. May I give it respect and attention? So that's one piece, is to, just to really allow that it's there, to acknowledge it, yeah. and then to move from the storyline of special person is not treating me with respect and my parents didn't treat me with interest to just the energy that's there in the body. And if in doing this inner work you can move from the storyline to the energy and just say be as big as you are and let that anger have all the space in the world. Inside what, your own mind. Inside your own body primarily. Body. Yeah. yeah, inside your own body. Like let it rip. I found, and I've worked with many, many people this way, where I keep saying, let it be as big as it is. Well, it's filling the room. Now what is it doing? It's filling the whole galaxy. You know, it gets very, very big. Eventually what happens if you really give free reign to that anger is you discover underneath it uh, the deep place of grief or the deep place mm -hmm. of woundedness. And that has in it, comes hand in hand with a real tenderness and we start reconnecting with where love is just by contacting the pain underneath the anger mm -hmm. so that that's just a process and it's I know it's hard Rick when you just list it out um, in words but going right into the source of the anger and also into where there's hatred because uh, you know we don't like to acknowledge that there's hatred but if a parent mm -hmm. has neglected or abused or in, in some way um, put us down, made us not matter, there can be um, a feeling of hatred that uh, needs to be acknowledged too. And yeah. again, if you can separate out the feeling from the story and let it be as much as it wants to be, there's an intelligence in it. Right. There's a real power to acknowledging anger and hatred as an energy in the body, and it actually lets us reconnect with vital energies that um, are part of being creative. Yeah. Okay, so here I am. I'm an accommodator, let's say. Um, I'm embarrassed to say that I'm the special person in, our, in my marriage, and I'm going to go away and think more about this myself. But that said, uh, so let's say I'm the accommodator, and I've opened this can of worms inside myself. Now I'm in touch with my anger, my hatred, my shame, you know, my sorrow all the rest of that, and I've separated that out from the events, the story, as you put it, of my life, and now I'm getting ready to communicate with this person, okay? Uh, and I'm not the world's best communicator, and he's not the world's best listener, let's say it's that kind of a situation. Uh, okay, how about some practical tips? You've been down this road a lot yourself, I've helped a lot of people. The can of worms has popped open, I'm really in touch with the mess inside me, how can I talk about it skillfully? Okay, first off, if you're really not a com good communicator and not used to contacting those emotions and you really have on your hands a not good listener, then therapeutic support is advised. Let's say that's not an option. And it's kind of normal range stuff, but it's real and i got to talk to them about it. Okay, if it's real, the best advice that I know for myself is 
take the time to come to a wise and awake relationship with what's inside me first. Because if there's anger there, I've separated from the story, and I've been with what's underneath it, for me, that usually leads to a place of self-compassion for the woundedness inside me, and also a sense of empowerment, where I feel I'm with myself again. Once we're with ourselves, Let's say I've done that. That's great. It's very useful, by the way. I'm and, glad you said and, that. And How do I talk about it? Okay, then we can begin to say to another person, and this is without blaming, this is not, without saying, you make me feel. Mm -hmm. We can say, we have a dance, a pattern, and what comes up in me in the midst of this pattern of, um, and then name objectively what's going on. And by the way, this is um, nonviolent communications, I think is the, um, the best uh, description of, of some of the principles behind this. But to name objectively what happens when you, know, when you want this to happen and I go along with it, what comes up in me, and it comes from way, way, way back, is a sense of that I don't matter. And it sets off a kind of resignation, and I'm accommodating, but I end up withdrawing and not feeling as connected. And there's distance. And, and this is an important piece, I deeply want to feel our closeness. I love you. I want to feel connected. And if I play out that pattern, there's a distance. So I just wanted to name it out loud to you so we could begin to change together, see how this might emerge. So you're not blaming the other person. You're not blaming. You're taking responsibility. And you're staying you're close to your own experience because you're the authority. You're the world's expert on your own experience. Exactly. You're naming it. You're not, mm. you're not blaming but you're making clear that your intention is to create more understanding and connection. Yeah. And if and you have those pieces together. Mm -hmm. And you have, so you have positive intentions, including positive intentions toward the other person. That's and exactly just to flag it for those who may not know about it, nonviolent communication, Marshall Rosenberg, great technology, basically a great approach that summarizes as when X happens, described objectively, I feel Y because I need Z. Yeah. And then sometimes afterward, we make a request, right? That would be the basic structure of that approach. Beautifully put together. Thank you okay. for saying it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Okay, I'm glad we took this swerve here. And we've already emphasized um, the importance of mindfulness. We've done it implicitly. Uh, and we're going to be using that term a little bit more here. And I wondered if you could kind of give us a nice definition of mindfulness. What does it mean to be mindful? It means to be paying attention to our moment-to-moment -moment experience, being in the present moment without judgment. And typically, it's a purposeful attention. We're, we're doing it on purpose. It takes some intention since our conditioning is so much to not be here. Yeah. I want to add one added piece, which is that the Mindful is also heartful. Mm, right. um, in in the in Sanskrit, the the symbols for mind and heart are really it's really the same. So you could say I'm being mindful and noticing what's happening in the present moment. Also heartful, relating and regarding with a quality of heart. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, and then I can feel intuitively because I'm very self mindful that there is another little bit I wanted to pursue with you about how to speak from the heart to someone uh, when what you're speaking is a can of worms and in some ways there's an it could be taken the wrong way as it were uh, by the other person so I wanna if we could go back to that one more time uh, so let's again say I'm the accommodator I have this can of worms I've gotten in touch with I've I've done the first round of speaking it to my partner okay and my partner behaves badly. And what I mean by that is that my partner kind of nods and says, and maybe gets defensive, says, you're blaming me yet again, or counterattacks and says something like, well, you think you're special. It's always got to be the way you want it with the kids, or something like that, all right? In the real world, you and I are both longtime therapists, including with couples, uh, what can I then do how can I speak um, in that round in a way that's skillful? 
when I'm met with resistance or counterattack or blaming from the other person. So when that happens, when we get that resistance, it brings up a reactivity in us. So the first step is to go slow. Because if we don't pause, we will not be, we'll lose touch with what's going on inside us and then just come from our more familiar ways of coming back, which is either to withdraw or attack mm -hmm. ourselves. So the first piece is to pause. And I, I, just to say my favorite line from Viktor Frankl is, between the stimulus and the response, there is a space. And in that space is our power and our freedom. Mm -hmm. Find some space, just go slow. <laughs> go slow and then come into your body because all the reactions are in the body and if we can feel it in our body and breathe and just internally recognize what's going on, like just say anger or fear, in some way name it or note it, which is one of the really valuable tools of mindfulness. Mm. Note it to oneself, yes, name to oneself what one is feeling, yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's kind of a mental whisper, mm. you know. In those moments of noticing it and naming it, there's less identification with it. We've got a little more freedom in how we respond. So that, that's the first step. Again, to sense our intention. Because if you've loosened up and you're not quite as reactive, you notice that there's anger, but you sense, okay, a little more space. Okay, what matters right now? And then you sense, well, what really matters is understanding. And whatever we say next can be evaluated with the lens of, will this bring about more understanding? And this is something, Rick, I've seen over and over again, that if you can pay attention to both your intention and your sense of the outcome, like if I say such and such, it's going to just create more of a reaction. You might at that moment decide not to continue the conversation because there's too much um, tension going on, but to pick it up again when things are calmer. Or you might decide, okay, I'm going to continue, but I need a different tact. And the different tact would be to ask my partner how he or she feels would most create a sense of... of uh, understanding or harmony or whatever when such and such comes up. Sometimes asking questions ra rather than taking the next explanation or justification can be helpful. Yeah, um, I think that's really useful. Um, building on the inner awareness that you're talking about, you know, retuning into oneself um, and also reestablishing uh, I, I call it keep your eyes on the prize. In other words, what's your what's your goal? What are you trying to get here? Um, what's your higher purpose? And also, and for me, this is an important detail, communicating for oneself. In other words, recognizing that uh, it's appropriate to be aware of, you know, attempting to influence the other person in some way. But at the end of the day, our power, our capacity to influence others is very limited, whereas we have enormous influence over ourselves. And therefore, when we communicate for ourselves, the success in a broad and healthy sense of the interaction is not based on what we get from the other person. It's based on, did I speak from the heart? Did I live by my own code? Did I practice my own virtues? Did I walk my own talk? Did I say it? Uh, did, I, did I have dignity and gravity here rather than holding back and walking on eggshells? Do I feel proud of myself for how I communicated? Uh, then I can be successful in terms of having that happen because that's under my influence, as it were. Uh, and I think, too, uh, while also always, of course, being aware of real threats um, uh, in communicating with somebody and real consequences, that said, as long as one is not really tipping into trouble, having the courage to take another swing at it. Uh, just because the other person batted it out of the park, as it were, doesn't mean you can't go back at it again. You don't need to buy into their script that because they spoke, the conversation's over. So. I, I really love what you're saying, because there's something about the integrity with yourself that does carry the day. And then there's the piece of, if we want 
to have the outcome of more understanding, more healing. Mindfulness includes our inner state, so we're tracking what's going on inside us and speaking from that. And it also includes me having the capacity as well as possible to include you and your experience in mindfulness. Because the more I seek to understand, well, how does this land for you? If that question's in there, then part of me speaking my truth is this collab- this sense of mutuality where I'm going to be able to deliver it in a way that's going to meet you better. So it's not, the integrity has not to do with just me, it has to do with us also. And there's a training in that. And um, this brings us into a whole different realm of the kind of practices that work in relationships. But a key training for any two people that want to get closer is to learn to see through each other's eyes. To be able, and you can't do it in the moment of peak frenzied reactivity. So it has to quiet some. So your example wouldn't be the time that I would then do a role reverse and try to say, well, how is Rick feeling right now? And what's his, what's the deep belief that's driving that? And what would it be like to be in his body right now? But there are other times that with our partners or if those we're getting closer to, if we can purposely take the time to imagine that person's life in the cir- particular circumstances, to sense where the fears are, the disappointments, to sense what beliefs or insecurities might be driving that person, then when we get into our dance, we'll be better able to express ourself in a way that'll be heard. That's great. And we're still expressing ourselves. Um, Good. Well, let's, if we could now, having had something of a master class uh, from you (laughs) in communication skills interpersonally, which, to make the point, could be applied not just obviously to a romantic or family or mate relationships, but what you've said here could, of course, be applied to business situations of different kinds and friendships and so on. as you know, I've been really dying to uh, in, to pursue this topic with uh, with a with a major mindfulness teacher such as yourself, which is romance and sexuality. Uh, we'll keep this at a PG thirteen level, generally speaking. But if you could, maybe we'll just kind of do it in steps here. Uh, the stage of dating. Uh, let's say someone is contemplating going back out in the dating world uh, and is nervous about that or it's just a nightmare, the bar scene, online services, whatever. Uh, or maybe someone is actually now in a, is starting to date somebody and it's not entirely clear where this is going to go. It's got some promises, but the jury's kind of out. Um, what kind of uh, practical wisdom could you offer, maybe from a mindfulness perspective uh, or a true refuge perspective or any perspective that you want to offer us uh, for that territory of, you know, kind of the romance dating section? We'll get to sexuality and long-term relationships next. <laughs> okay. I have a plan. Aha, uh-huh. I like it. I like it. Um, well, this first thing is no small first thing. I mean, in, in the evolution of the mating game, it's it's so high stakes that mm-hmm. it's it's intelligent and compassionate to get that our deepest longing is to find intimacy and our deepest fear is rejection. And so it's fraught. It's a ride. It really is. And, um, you know, Jules Pfeiffer, he has this because we talk so much about the pursuer and the avoider that in a certain amount of time it can easily turn into any dating or any romance. It doesn't stay casual for long. You know, somebody wants something more than someone else. Jules Pfeiffer has a great cartoon where he's got the the woman saying something like, but I love you. And he, the man saying, don't you threaten me. (laughs) And it's like that. It's, it, it's not always the male-female dividing up that way. But yeah. um, very quickly and very easily, it gets, in, it gets into that, that uncharted territory where old patterns come up. And so this is where mindfulness comes in in two ways, that many, many ways. But one of them is that it helps us to see our patterning. You know, it helps us 
to maybe not believe our thoughts so much and keep coming back to what's actually here because we can recognize, okay, this is a pattern that has been played out for many, many years where I start getting insecure as soon as somebody acts like this. Pause. (laughs) Don't believe my thoughts. Come in and just start doing that moment-to-moment work. Take refuge in the moment till we can get to a place of some strength and self-compassion and confidence in that moment. And the more In terms of tuning into our own experience. Exactly right. Opening to it. Yes. And so the, the given is that I mean, the bottom line, this is, this is what's guaranteed, is that in the dating process and in romance, all the shadow places, all the old patterns of insecurity will eventually hit surface. Mm-hmm. Now, in romance, there's, there can be a period of infatuation. One person described it as the 2.5 best minutes of his life. <laughs> you know? you know, we're That's pretty there. short. <laughs> yeah, you, it, la- it can last a couple of years, but there's a, a whole co- a chemical cocktail that we're on. Yeah. You know, they've likened it to cocaine addiction or whatever. But once the chemicals are metabolized, once we're not on the enchantment high, all the old patterning comes forward. That's the given. So how do we want to respond? And, and mindfulness enables us to respond rather than react in the old patterns. And how does that happen? Kind of the way we've already been talking. That we get the flag, okay, I'm going into the one who wants more and I'm grasping and I'm getting oversensitive. Or we're the one who, uh uh-oh, somebody's wanting to suffocate me, grab me, take over my life, I need to pull back. Whatever our flag is. And... And we find some ways to pause and be with our inner experience so that we don't believe our thoughts. Because mindfulness says, you know, don't believe the thoughts. Come into where it's living in the body. And if we can do that, we can begin to loosen the identification with the old patterns and have more the self-compassion, more understanding, and enter it with a little more choice to um, not react so much. Mm. So that's one way that, you know, we can navigate the dating scene and navigate early romance. The other is I think mindfulness enables us to enjoy the ride. <laughs> it's like we, you, you have done the best job of anybody on taking in the good. You really have. Mindfulness enables us to pause and go, wow, this is pleasant. You know, don't hold on, but hey, enjoy. You know, and to get familiar with the pleasant, to to actually be with somebody and sense the affection that's there and pause long enough to have our our nervous system start feeling like this bath of, oh, it can be like this. We retrain the brain that way. Mm-hmm. So it it enables us both to deal with the the patterning that gets us insecure and enjoy the pleasantness. And one of the one of the ways Jonathan and I do it is, and we're a little longer term, is we kind of have this joke that when things are are really going beautifully, let's say we're out for a walk and we're enjoying each other's company, we'll stop, and we'll say, and Jonathan will say, "This is it," and I'll go, "Nah, this is it." No, 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 no. And then he'll go, "This," and we keep taking the moment and going, "This." But we really try to get that it's this moment and really take it in. Mm. So both in both those ways, uh, mindfulness can bring alive our life in a romantic, uh, relational way. That's great. Part of um, the dating process is dealing with the dreaded experience of rejection and uh, both the fear of it and then what to do if, when it actually occurs. Uh, With regard to both mindfulness and also any other uh, tools or perspectives you could offer here, um, how can people deal with fears of rejection or realities of of rejection? The the given is that we all have been wounded and will get wounded. And so it's, in psychology, they call it affect tolerance. Can we create enough space and balance and equanimity within us so that when it hurts, there's room for it. You know, it's like the classic metaphor of putting dye in a sink or dye in a lake, and it 
it will color this, the water in the sink, but not so much the lake. <clears throat> it's how to find, and this is one of the themes in True Refuge, how to find that inner refuge of space and love and ease that that's enough so that whatever comes up, we have a way to handle it. It's um, the heart that's ready for anything. And that includes love, that we're available to <clears throat> engage in that that dance, that we're available to appreciate beauty and we're available to um, be with the grief around loss. And um, so that's, an on, that's a life practice, Rick, that we deal with rejection. It'll come when we're not such a big lake of space and then we'll just have to feel, you know, love hurts, losing love hurts and um, as much compassion as we can hold ourselves with. And other times there'll be more space for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, that's great. That kind of does it for me. Uh, so sexuality, uh, any comments on that? Uh, about bringing a wisdom or a mindfulness, a practical intelligence to sexu being, being sexual, to sex itself? Well, the first thing is that just by posing it, it makes me think of how little Buddhist Dharma addresses it in a practical way, you know, in terms of wet in the West, uh, how little spiritual paths do, and how it's this huge force that allows creation to keep going. And there's something about that, like, what gives here, you know? That, And so one piece is to say our culture, we're so imprinted to have a kind of uh, compartmentalized sense that sexuality is apart from the rest of our spiritual unfolding. And it's incredibly... Um, enlivening and truthful to recognize that this engagement of, of energy and of pleasure is, has, has the potential to, ex we can experience incredible communion. And um, just to know that, that's just one piece. And then how does mindfulness help? It's like a bunch of ways that it makes a really big difference. I and mean, one of the ways that I most think of is that what gets in the way of sexual pleasure, fun, communion is stress, insecurity, feelings of shame about our bodies. I mean, we have so much going on in us that shuts our system down at the time that we want to be most open. And, I mean, we know that when we're in fight, flight, freeze, blood flow does not go to the genitals. I mean, just that simple. I mean, it just doesn't. So if we're talking about flow that opens us up, mindfulness can help to reduce the reactivity to stress. It can help to bring us back into the moment. Mindfulness stimulates the parts of the brain that actually let us feel proprioceptive awareness, what's going on in our body. I mean, there's all this science that says that it you know, thickens the insula, which you know about more than I do, which the superhighway that connects the... the brain and the body. There's been research studies showing that women who practice mindfulness for a certain amount of time have more arousal, you know, quicker and more mm. than those that don't. I mean, there's, it's so, it's nice that science is, yeah. <laughs> you know, affirming all of this, and yet it's intuitive, too, that um, mindfulness can help us to get out of our minds, into our bodies, and be here for this place of deep communication energetically. So I mean, that's, that's the first level response. I could say more, but I'd love to you know, just hear what, if that brings up anything for you as I speak. Uh, it, well, it brings up admiration and appreciation for how relevant and useful that is and skillfully navigated as well. Um, if I could maybe follow on a little bit and thinking about practical situations. So, uh, Imagine a situation where a person is at one of those choice points in a relationship. I think of the dating mating process as moving through like a stair with a series of steps and you're deciding whether to go to the next step. Uh, and you take the next step and sometimes you think, oh my God, 
I should have never taken that step. Other times you think, why didn't I take that step a month ago? Okay. So let's suppose you're considering one of those steps and uh, let's say related to, to having sex um, and internally it just doesn't feel right. But on the other hand, you can't tell if that sense that it just doesn't feel right is, as you put it, some trance state learned from your past or rather the still voice of, the quiet voice of wisdom whispering in your ear, telling you, no, 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 sweetie, don't do this right now. So how can a person maybe, as you put it, pause, slow things down to come to terms with and kind of sort out those inner inclinations and find some kind of place of comfortable clarity, you know, to either take the next step or not? That's a very, it's a great question. It's going to be very person to person. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to take it and imagine mm -hmm. different people I know and imagine myself and all the different things that go into it. But here's a few things that come to mind mm -hmm. with it. One is that we really have to feel safe enough, and this is more for women than men, because in an evolutionary way, it's not just about sex. It's also about that the person stick around and take care of our kids and make us safe. Mm -hmm. So to lean in the direction of even, even if it's like you might say to yourself, well, it's just fear that's stopping me, you know, to respect it to respect it and to listen to it. It's in part of this communication with our inner life um, to ask that voice of fear to express itself and to listen deeply um, is really useful and it actually is something to take time with. Mm. You know, it's valuable. Mm. I haven't heard too many people ever confess that they blew it because they didn't get sexual fast enough with someone. I just haven't heard that. I've heard the opposite. Um, there are so many ways to start creating intimacy that don't, that don't go into sexuality or at least genital sexuality that stay on, that can stay sensual and have some erotic flavors. There's so many levels of intimacy that uh, to spend time exploring and developing communication on those can never hurt. I'm thinking of a male friend of mine, um, very robust heterosexual guy, who uh, was telling me that the, uh, the hottest it's ever been was sitting on a park bench holding hands with a girl, uh, you know, when he was a younger man. Like, that's the hottest it ever was. I think back in my days, you know, of just kissing in the very beginning, like, oh my God. Um, it's that moment in the movie Starman where he finally has cherry pie a la mode. It's like, oh my God, this is so good. <laughs> anyway, but your point is really well taken, and I, I agree with you. Very often people just, they jump to the finish line, and it's the race that's really the most fun. Uh, so, yeah, and, and you know what that brings to mind is that yeah. we we are very disconnected from our bodies in this culture anyway. Mm -hmm. And because um, genital sexual arousal is so strong, that we can feel, but we can't feel all these other incredibly delicious, subtle, and amazing yeah. places of energy exchange. So to also take the time to wake up our bodies and mm -hmm. to uh, go into a very receptive mode, which we can't do when we're not feeling safe or go into a very passionate assertive mode which we can't do if we're not safe it actually frees us up to to have have it be from a whole beingness which is really the possibility i mean i think um myself in terms of chakras i just find that a useful um mental frame uh, frame for understanding but if we sense that there are different uh vibrational levels of energy in the body and that ultimately it's possible to wake them all up so there's a complete flow in communication with our partner on every level from the you know most um, earthy and genital and sexual to you know the sense of that, w that this is just one awareness experiencing this play that's the possibility and um, that I love even talking about it because it's an invitation for all of us to mm. slow down enough to wake ourselves up for each other. Slow down enough to wake ourselves up for each other. That's really great. Well, along the lines of that, thinking really about both same-gender couples and heterosexual couples, uh, 
very often, I think there is a situation where they're in a relatively long-term relationship, so the infatuation wave has worn off. They like each other, they love each other, it's safe, it's close, and so forth. But there's a fundamental asymmetry in how interested one member of the couple is in actually getting to it and being sexual, uh, as well as more generally uh, maintaining a kind of erotic dimension to the relationship. Whereas for the other person, they're willing, but it's honestly just not a priority, basically. Uh, if those fires get lit, uh, then, you know, the fire can blaze, but otherwise they're just not that into it. It's not just, just not top of mind. Um, and yet they kind of sort of wish they were more into it because they could see that it would be nice because every time they are into it, it turns out well and they're glad they were into it. They're glad they, they hung out by that fire and warmed their, hand by it, their hands by it for a while. But otherwise, they're just, they're just not very motivated. Um, any reflections or thoughts about that? Because I've seen that be a real issue in a number of relationships. So you're talking about relationships that are more long. To people are already established as a couple, but there's an uneven interest in sex. Yeah. Okay. That happens more often than not. So that's the first thing. It's just to, to normalize it and say, just like um, we might be together, and one of us would be more interested in going to a when we're traveling, going to the cultural centers, and another wants to climb mountains. So it's. You know, it's not it's not a pathology and it's not a deal breaker to have a different level of interest. Where it gets painful is if one person feels it translates to rejection mm -hmm. or it translates to feeling cut off and not having a way towards intimacy. Mm -hmm. So that's the place that if the couple pays attention and out of care for each other has some flexibility in experimenting to make sure that um, there's a feeling of love and acceptance and aliveness in the relationship. And then what comes down to, and this is in every couple, there's some, um, some negotiating and experimenting as I can give a little more in this area even though I'm not that drawn to it and see if that builds a new habit or you can give a little more in this area even though you're not drawn to it, but maybe that'll build a new habit. If there's enough of a basic commitment to nourishing each other and nourishing the relationship, that imbalance can be held in something larger and be okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. You know, just in passing, I, I remember this uh, mom, young kids, who commented once uh, laughingly. She says, well, foreplay for me starts in the morning when he helps make their lunches. Uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah. speaking of long-term relationships, you're in one, and what are some of the key takeaway points? We've got about 10 more minutes here. Uh, okay. Some of the key takeaway points that you'd like to offer about sort of best odds approaches to helping oneself have a good long-term lasting love relationship. Well, I think the biggest, most central thing is conscious aspiration. And this is true whether it's a good long-term relationship or it's, you know, liberation on the spiritual path, which actually to me are very much the same in a way. Mm -hmm. But that we're very conscious of our aspiration to live and express from loving presence. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there's a beautiful Rumi line that says something like you don't have to seek your love just seek to discover the the barriers or the blocks to love and so for me and Jonathan it's that it's that awareness that this really matters at the end of our life looking back this is what matters is that kind of um, presence and love that we that we offer with each other and and therefore to be alert to whatever gets in the way and willing to, and this is where the courage comes in, open to where the vulnerability is, because whenever there's a barrier to love, hmm. you know, whenever I'm caught in special person or he's in accommodating, underneath that, both of us have a certain vulnerability playing out. Hmm. And so the, the next step is to be able to have that courage to feel it and to name it. And I'll share with, I'll share with you, just because um, this really, 
it, it hit me um, recently. I was re remembering our wedding vows, and uh, there was one uh, line I remember we both said to each other, a Relka line, which is, I want to unfold. Let no place in me hold itself closed. For where I am closed, I am false. I want to stay clear in your sight. And there's something about wanting to be transparent, wanting not to have to pretend or cover over, that, and being willing to, to name and speak truths to each other that are scary to speak, that keeps the intimacy alive. So that that's what comes. That's the most immediate thing that comes to mind. Mm. Thank you. That's great. I'm pausing just because it's really landing what you're saying. That's great. Well, in our remaining time, uh, I've got two questions for you that I ask everybody. Uh, the first one is again, as personally as you're willing to answer this, what's your growing edge yourself these days? in relationships, and, and how are you working with it? Well, in a very broad way, there's the growing edge, I think, is what it, it has been always, which is a tendency to judge and distance with judging. Whether I'm judging myself, you know, I'm not showing up enough, I'm being too yeah. busy and preoccupied, you know, what's wrong with me, or judging myself for self-centeredness, or whether I'm judging the other person. And my one of my big commitments has been to, um, you know, I call it RAIN on blame, because I use RAIN, RAIN as that acronym for um, applying mindfulness to a situation. Whenever there's blame or judgment, to not believe my thoughts that anybody else is wrong or that I'm wrong, mm. to not believe that but rather to sense what's underneath the energy of, of judgment or blame. And that to me is just like this fast track, because mm -hmm. if I can wake up out of blame, if I can wake up out of judgment, uh, then I can find my way to understanding and connection. Mm -hmm. But it's very seductive, because it gets subtler and subtler, or I'm not even realizing, it's not, a, it's not like some big out and out judgment of, oh, you stupid fool you, it's more just some sense of uh, somebody else not doing it the way they should be doing it, or could be doing it, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but what do you do when you know you're right? When I know I'm right? <laughs> you know that line that the whole world is divided into those who think they're right? And that's the whole line. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, there you are. Yeah. Yeah, um, I get interested, Rick. I mean, when I when I have that sense, and you can see it with politics so much, it's like, but of course this is the right way to. I mean, of course my view is right. This is compassionate. This is fair, you know. And and even then, just to in some way get okay, this is an idea, you know. It's it's not truth. It's just an idea about the world. And the more I can get, it's just an idea about the world that I'm that's being held, you know. Uh, there's not quite as much investment in it. There's a little more humility. <laughs> mm. But I have to get interested. I have to get interested and really investigate that sense of rightness. Interested uh, in, in your own mind or interested in your own yes. mental content. And uh, interested in how we hold to being right. And, yeah. and so sometimes we hold to being right because we really think it's true. And other times it's really dangerous not to be right, as in an argument where we keep on justifying ourselves because it's really dangerous to not be, to be the one that's wrong. If, wow. our, if our view is wrong, then we're in some way bad or weak or whatever. Um, just to, to watch that process of the mind that holds on to being right, because it gets in the way in a very deep way from uh, loving. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Well, the last question, uh, again, what I ask people in general is, uh, if there were one practice that you could nominate for a critical mass of human brains these days, uh, 10 million, 100 million, a billion brains, uh, if there were one practice that uh, a critical mass of human brains could do for, let's say, five minutes or so a day, what would you nominate as the one practice that you think would make the most difference in helping guide the world to a softer landing? Well, I'm going to cheat by saying the one I just mentioned, but since I already mentioned, I won't review it, but really moving from uh, a grievance to feeling what's underneath it, 
whether it's grief or fear or whatever, mm. but not believing blame, not, not riding the blame train. The other is um, taking the time to see through other people's eyes. Um, this is the basis of the, the Tibetan compassion practices of Tunglin. It's the basis of discovering uh, our connectedness. Thoreau says that the greatest miracle on earth is to be able to see through another's eyes for even a moment. Mm. So if we can take somebody that we care about and let's take a moment to say, what is it really like to experience life through that body and with that heart? Mm. Uh, what is it really like? Then we will be able to respond to our world uh, with much more intelligence and much more kindness. That's great. And could you just say a little word more about feeling beneath the surface of the grievance or the rightness, or the anger, feeling beneath it to what? And why do that? It's icky underneath there. No one, that's why I don't want to feel underneath there. Yeah. When we are really blaming, if we think about what's going on, we've been hurt. We each have a, a wound of unlove, or a wound of something's wrong with me. And when we've been wounded, somebody else in some way has made us feel unsafe or not okay and blame is a way to stay away from that not okay feeling blame is our armor and by putting down blame and going into that not okay feeling we've gone through the only portal that's possible if we're to actually heal that sense of unlovableness or not okayness we can never heal it by continuing on the storyline of you're wrong, because we stay hooked in as the victim. But if we go right into what's underneath the armor and begin to bring the wings of mindfulness, which are really attending and befriending, if we really bring a presence to that sense of unworthiness, that sense of not okayness, we start to discover a space and a presence and a strength and a profound sense of goodness that helps us to rewire our brain in relationship to ourselves. We start sensing a goodness of who we are. Mm. But that's the only pathway, is to put aside the projecting outward of badness and to come in and bring a very loving, healing presence to the place in us which is hurting. There, there's a line that says, vengeance is a lazy form of grief. It's a lazy form of fear. It's, it's, it's a way to defend and protect, but it does not uproot the uh, suffering itself. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Beautiful way to end here. Um, as always, uh, it's just such a great pleasure to hang out with you. And uh, I'm delighted to encourage people to go check out your website, tarabrock.com where there's a weekly free podcast offered, as well as a lot of other resources that are freely available, and also information about your teaching schedule, your most recent book, uh, True Refuge, a uh, very, very profound and powerful book, uh, as well as other good things that you're doing. So Tara, thank you. Thank you for taking the time with us here. Oh, it's my pleasure, and it's always a treat to be with you, Rick. So oh, thank you. Great. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you.